Well, good morning uh, here from London and also from East Anglia. I'm delighted to have a fellow uh, Gresham professor here, Professor Richard Harvey, uh, who's Professor of Computer Science at the University of East Anglia, but also the Gresham Professor of Computer Science. And Richard is here to talk about a subject very dear to my heart, why British tech investors fail and Americans succeed. Time to reinvent futurology. Uh, Richard will be explaining futurology and, and that as we go through it. But it is a t topic that having run fairly large research institutes uh, and doing a lot of research myself, I'm constantly stunned at how little we still know about how to take elements of science and technology and develop them into successful businesses. Uh, I think Richard has put this title forward to be a little provocative because clearly there are British successes and there are American failures without question. Uh, but it is nevertheless true that over several decades we have seen a relative success in America versus a less successful British sector. And at a time when our Prime Minister assures us that we need to be a high-tech superpower, it's uh, time to have a deep look at some of the subject matter. Now you know me, I'm Michael Minelli, I'm one of the directors of Zien, and I'm only able to introduce all of these webinars thanks to the generosity and, I hasten to add, tolerance of our sponsors who allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics and finance. And today's session is clearly going to appeal, I think, to all of us uh, because it does cover all of those subjects. Now, my job is to get out of the way quickly so you can hear from our expert. And I'll do that in just a moment after I make three quick announcements. The first one is, yes, there are slides and they are already posted. So you can uh, ha have a look at the slideshow and deck as we go along. We will uh, be putting up the presentation, which is being recorded in approximately two working days. So it should go up sometime around midday on Friday. Um, but finally, and most importantly, uh, Richard is seeking a lot of interaction with the audience. Nobody in the subject area really knows the answer, uh, certainly not me. Maybe Richard does, we'll find out before the end. Uh, but what he is going to do is have about 20 minutes of questions and answers. Please use the GoToWebinar Q&A facility. Uh, there's no point in emailing me, texting me, WhatsApping me, what have you, because I'm here with you. Uh, but if you feed them in uh, to the Q&A facility, I will uh, insert them into a conversation with Richard as we go forward. And a warning for you, hands on buzzers, he's got two polls as well. So he really wants to hear uh, what you think. May I also point out that all of the Q&A will get to Richard with your email attached. So if you just want to contact him about something, ask him, refer him to something that you've done, please feel free to do so. He will get all of those, but I'll feed most of the comments and observations into our conversation. So with that bit of housekeeping, Richard, uh, the floor is very much yours and I'm looking forward to this. Thank you, Michael. Uh, nice to be here. This is one of these talks where um, you can be sort of relatively confident, I think, that um, there are people in the audience who know a lot more about it than you do, uh, which is the best sort of talk as far as I'm concerned. Now then, um, let's start with a poll. Um, so tech investors are routinely faced with the possibility of multiple investments. Uh, they have to choose between you know, attractive alternatives. And here are five possible investments that I'd like you to consider on a 10 year time scale. Um, I'm gonna give you a short pen portrait of each one and then we'll open the voting. I'd like you to vote on the basis of really what I'm telling you rather than what Dr. Google might tell you, okay? So let's just go through these. Um, let me give you a nice sort of description of them, um, visual description of them. So the first one, number one, this is the Martin Jetpack. Uh, despite its name, it uses ducted fans for lift, gives it about 20 kilometers or 30 minutes of range. Top speeds around 25 miles an hour. You can see someone driving it, so it's mature technology. It's being demonstrated as we can see here. Number two, this is a 3D bioprinter. System has two print heads. One sprays out gel that forms a sort of armature for living cells, and the other fills in the gaps with living cells. The cells are harvested from a donor, so there are no rejection issues. You could print a new kidney or a new liver or teeth. Uh, this is one of those inventions that you know could change the course of medicine, I think. Number three, this is an invention from a legendary Nathan Mervold, formerly chief scientist of Microsoft. So malaria is a massively economically disruptive disease. This, desired, disease listen, this device listens to the squeaks of mosquitoes. Uh, if it's the right squeak, then it zaps it with a laser. Number four, underwater kites. They're anchored in deep water. Uh, there's a turbine in each. Power is fed back via the anchors uh, to produce completely green power. And number five, this is the pavement. 
that uh, is connected to electric generators. So as people um, walk on the pavement, it generates completely green electricity. Right. Okay, well, we've opened the poll. Um, please, uh, Richard, our audience is normally uh, fairly, fairly opinionated and quite quick, but we'll give them just a minute to think about those. I might point out actually that two years ago I was in uh, Seattle uh, and I did see Nathan and I went to his labs and I saw the mosquito zapper in action, believe it or not. All right, uh, half the audience have voted. Folks, uh, ready to make up your minds here? We've got some definite favorites here and uh, nobody seems to like James Bond. I think we'll just close that poll now and show the results. And you can see uh, more than half the audience loving the 3D bioprinter, none loving the jetpack and fairly split on the green kite and electric pavement. And it's a shame really, because the mosquito laser gun is pretty cool. Back to you, Richard. Fine, let's do one more. Um, I'll, and then I'll summarize, because I think I can already see some conclusions coming out of this. Right, uh, these are all real businesses, which I've come across. Um, I used to chair a VC credit committee. Um, the credit committee is the group of people who green light investments. Um, I changed a few details because they're all real companies and I don't want to um, you know, tar them with any sort of brush. So let's look at number one. This is a, I thought this was way cool technology. It's essentially a linear motor attached to a float. Most wave generators use, have rotational energy, so they've got the pain of trying to couple wave action into rotations. It's all a bit of a pain. This is up and down. Excellent team, PhD level engineers, very high level of innovation. Number two, uh, find the field, need some suitable power lines. Uh, remember that access to the grid is a big block for a lot of many green electricity projects. Find the farmer that owns it, negotiate to rent the field, fill it with solar panels and sell the electricity back to the grid. You can fill the field with sheep if you like to keep the grass down under the panels. It's all proven technology, uh, no, really no innovation at all. You can just buy it off the shelf. Number three, this company has exclusive rights to bore for geothermal around a large infrastructure. Let's say Heathrow, just for the purposes of this discussion. So you can heat the whole of Heathrow and the district and the neighborhood using a district heating system. Uh, very well-known technology. You know, Russians and Scandinavians have been doing this a year. So again, innovation is minor. And the fourth one is this company makes smart switches and light fittings so that any switch can be programmed to switch any light fitting. A neat thing about this really was there was a lot of innovation which managed to drive the price down to near the price of a conventional switch. So this system has a simpler installations and it uses less wire than a conventional um, explanation, a uh, conventional alternative. Um, if I had to rank these by not rank, if I had to give them a sort of innovation score, I, I would, I would do that. Right. Let's have a vote on those. Okay. Well, folks, as you can see, we've got to uh, play your own kind of armchair VC um, with linear wave way up there, uh, out there on uh, technological advance and solar fields being nice and boring. So over to you. Uh, over two thirds of the audience have voted. I'll leave it open just a few more seconds. As I said, they're quite opinionated out here and we're ready to go and have a look at the results. Um, so uh, basically folks are really quite keen on geothermal and geothermal power. And I must say it is intriguing, um, but they are equally uh, fairly attracted to uh, advancing technology on the linear motor. Back to you, Richard. I'm so relieved. All right because I think you got this all wrong and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased you did. Um, so let's just go through it. So I think the first batch of inventions were all listed by Time magazine as best inventions of 2010. Okay, so we're in 2021 now, so they should be well successful, okay? Jetpack companies closed. Um, there is There are alternative jetpack companies out there using different technology, but I wouldn't, you'd have lost your shirt if you'd invested in that one. Um, 3D print heads, well, it's a nice idea, but they're medical, man. So you've got the massive, great lead-in to get through medical cycle. Uh, no sign of a mosquito killer. You know, the technology is very clever, but this, it's got to be deployed at low cost in around the world to work. And this is a high-tech solution for what is basically a low-tech, um, you know, a, a low-tech uh, deployment. Underwater kites, mm, 
okay, well, offshore technology, terrible record, you know, notoriously slow. Uh, this one it is still alive, but massive amounts of, of um, Scandinavian state investment has um, been gone into that. Pavement generator, they're still alive. Okay, you can you can go out and buy a pavement generator. Um, there's not much electricity that comes from a pavement, so it's all been deployed in sort of fun places like um, corporate boardrooms and you know shows and so on, but it hasn't really delivered. Um, of the other four, I'm very confident that my appraisal of their technology has nothing to do with their success. I can tell you now, the most successful business out of all of those was number two, which was the solar fields, right? Completely low tech. We got in and out of that in very fast, it was a very effective investment, did a lot for the green energy agenda. This was a green business fund. Um, what else, what did you like, dear audience? You like geothermal, they're still not out of the ground, okay? <laughs> I mean, the exclusive rights sound good, don't they? But they're still not out of the ground, the problem is, You've got to drill deep holes near lots of urban areas, and that's a political question. Um, number four went bust for political reasons, if I remember, or for personality reasons. Uh, but there's a lot of competitors. Would you install something in your house that has only single source supplied? That was the issue there. So what I was trying to draw out there was, maybe not as clearly as I would wish, but the a lot of the blockers were nothing to do with the technology at all. So Although it was very nice that there was lots of, um, in a, you know, there was lots of people like me, professors, looking at the technology and trying to decide whether it was good, that was nothing to do with the success of the business or marginally to do with it. What really mattered was other stuff. So that is an unsurprising remark because most people would say a technology business is basically te good technology plus good management plus a market equals success. Those are the things that you require. Now. My own view would be innovation is, is nice to have in a technology business, but it's not as important as having a defensible advantage, which is a defensible advantage is you've got something that's difficult for other people to replicate. Um, by the way, everybody you ever meet says they've got first mover advantage um, in technology. It is worth nothing. Um, you know, you, the early bird might catch the worm, but it's the second mouse that gets the cheese, isn't it? And then as we move across this um, domain, you've got to evaluate these other things. And I know nothing about evaluating management, but I would say, at least in this country, um, track record is important, but connections, rather sadly, can be equally important. So it's not what you know, but who you know, particularly in the US and the UK. I think that's a rather sad fact, but we're not going to give a lecture about that. I would say, you know, youth is definitely no uh, indicator of um, success, and although I've heard it said that it is, that's not true either. What I wanted to focus on was the market, because as we go across this slide, my contention, ladies and gentlemen, is that we're getting less and less uh, able to evaluate things, but we're getting to the part of the proposition that's more and more important, and I think that's very annoying and sad and I just wanted to spend a few minutes explaining you know what's going on here and think a little bit about what we might do about that because I think that's a great problem now I'm, I'm writing I'm sort of writing or speaking to you as a technologist obviously I'm a big fan of technology but I do think that the lack of understanding of the market and the society in which it's going into is an absolute killer so let's have a let's have a quick look at that so where I'd sort of start is by just observing that most technology can be uh, pegged on um, this framework. This is the Department of Defense TRL ladder. And down here at the bottom of the slide, we've got professors working things out with uh, pencil and paper. And up the top of this slide, we've got people building, um, well, we've got stuff in operation. I, I, I mean, there aren't many innovations that go through this ladder in under 10 years. I mean, I, I was racking my brains to find ones that went through it in under 10. Um, the Apollo program, which was an unbelievable amount of money, probably about 15 when you look at it. You know, the Apollo program technically lasted a bit over 10 years, but, it, you know, the basic principles have been worked out some way before. 
So what we're really interested in here is that 10 year cycle. So what have we got for 10 to 20 years in the literature? You know, who's working on predicting society? Well, it's a really mixed pick picture. You know, um, on the top of this slide, oh, well, I wish I'd done another poll actually, which is who's heard of any of these people? You know, um, they're not exactly household names, are they? But they're, they're people, you've probably heard of some of the authors. I'm going to dismiss the authors who are down at the bottom of this slide. I mean, authors read, write to be read, you know, not read, they're not writing to be right. Um, but look, there's an awful lot of people over here at plus 50, yeah, talking. We're not interested in that. We can't invest in that. We're interested over here, and there aren't many of them. You know, um, Faith Popcorn's a good read if you've not come across her before. She's um, an expert on, she developed um, cocooning is one of her themes. Okay, and she's she's great because she has very sort of catchy titles for, or um, the vigilante consumer is another one of her trends, and it's realistic short. John Naisbit was um, he he he's the mega trends man. He said um, he's not very keen on uh, being called a futurologist. He aggressively calls himself not, but he was called the great noticer. So he would collect newspaper stories and try and draw some uh, conclusions about the themes. Schwartz is the um, Global Business Network man, he did um, scenario planning. He made scenario planning work, really. It was, scenario planning was developed by Herman Kahn at the Rand Corporation in the um, 1960s. But Schwartz was quite an expert at this and is widely credited of um, predicting 9-11, amongst other things. So there's a little bit, there's not, there's not very many names on the list. If you're interested, by the way, um, there are a couple of little popular books that might be worth a read. Uh, there's this one by Uma Strathern called The Future, Brief History of the Future. That must be about the fifth book called that. And the one by John Uri, who's the great sociologist who died, died this year, called What is the Future? Also talks about the way people write about the future. Right, how can we do predictions then? Okay, well, the obvious one, I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna go through this fairly speedily. You take a trend that you're interested in, you try and find out what you know about it now. Let's take working from home, you know, since it's one that's WFH, which is one that's always, you know, it's in my mind at the moment. Here I am working from home. Um, you can peg that and then you look out into the future, you peg that and you draw a line. You know? Now, already, in my knowledge, I have gone considerably above the level of societal prediction that most venture capitalists would bother with. OK, now that might be a controversial statement, but I'm going to I'm going to stick with it. You know, I think I think I'm already doing more than we most people would do on societal planning. Right? Um, if you're prepared to do a few of those, then you're essentially doing scenario planning, as we would call it. Now, the great scenario planners in the world would be furious for me for just reducing them, their ideas to just a couple of lines. Um, Herman Kahn, um, you know, the, the idea of the scenarios is really their short stories that contain the future. Um, and then, you know, they are more sophisticated than I'm, I'm uh, claiming, but they, they would have this element to them. Um, I think one significant problem that isn't really tackled in the literature, but is coming out to be tackled, is optimism bias. And um, You've probably read it. There's a paper by Daniel Kahneman and others on delusions of success, how optimism undermines executive decisions. And that there aren't, there hasn't been built into many predictions yet. But the Department of Transport, of all people, has a nice one. Um, they have studied a whole range of projects and worked out how optimistic engineers and others are likely to be about either cost or duration. It's quite fascinating. What area do you think has the most optimism bias? You know, roads, rail bridges, tunnels, buildings, IT projects. Answer, IT projects, okay. 200% optimism uplift on the 80 percentile for IT projects. Roads are only 32%. You, if you can build a road and be fairly confident about it, it, it seems. Right, um, I'd like to get to the discussion. So here are my conclusions. Tech success is not about technology, all right? It's about understanding customers. And that means understanding society. And I don't think we're doing enough 
on understanding and predicting society. Those people who are working on it are sociologists who are working at the plus 50 year level, and I don't think that's very uh, helpful to us. If you want my five themes for the next decade, I would say men, work, economic e equity, and localization. Okay, the men, the role of men in society is changing, and I think that certainly deserves some attention. So innovation in that area is helpful. Work is obviously changing and has been changing for a while. You know, we'll soon be down to a four day week in some parts of the world. Economic equity. Most sociologists seem to think that economic equity will reduce their optimists. I don't buy that. I think it's just as likely that it will increase and that needs thinking about. And localization, doing things at home, building things close to you. Industry 2.0, micro news, um, is an obvious, all of those are obvious themes. Make of those what you will. I'm not um, claiming to be a prediction guy. Um, that, Michael, is a reasonable point for me to stop, given the time, I think. Well, Richard, thank you very, very much. Uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating to, to dwell on this, and I'm delighted that you've picked up on uh, this, this idea of futurology and the great mistakes we make in technology commercialization as well. We've got quite a few questions and comments. People do get them in quickly, though, uh, if you want them to be fed in. Um, I'm going to start with a, a first one, which uh, hopefully is a bit of a quick answer. It's from John O'Hara, and he wonders, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on individuals, but I think it's a fair point. Elon Musk must set the benchmark on the fastest from concept to time to market in multiple technology domains. You know, Any comments on that? Yeah, I think you're right. He pro the questioner probably knows more than I do about Elon Musk. I mean, he's such an odd person, isn't he? Um, he? He doesn't have to work with a committee, does he? That's one of his, that's one of his advantages. And um, he can bury his failures. So um, one of the things that hurts you in a lot of organizations that have multiple heads is very often you can be fired um, let me pick a university for an example in university you are not going to be fired usually for inactivity but you'll be fired for getting things wrong you know, so bad mistakes are usually punished but inactivity isn't punished that's very bad for innovation and corporate innovation because obviously you're going to make some mistakes in the prediction game and musk doesn't have that problem, does he? He doesn't have to fire himself. So I think that leads to an adventurous spirit, which uh, just allows him to innovate fast. I, I think we have a longer debate on whether or not uh, processes in innovation actually lead to anything. You know, it's a, it seems everybody sets up some type of funnel where we start with you know random ideas and we funnel down to the ones we're going to invest in, and then we bring them to market. A lot of cases where that doesn't work or stages are skipped or they're all there but you go through seven of them very very fast um, and I, I don't know to me it's always been kind of anti-process process now Hugh Purser has, a, has a, I think a good question about your thesis which is broadly futurology uh, is important in setting the context for the investment he says is there any evidence that the well-known big tech American successes actually successfully predicted uh, societal change and advancements Oh, yeah. I mean, I think if you look at the big five IT companies and you start to so you ask it the other way around, which is let's look at the big IT companies and just sort of rank them for innovation. Right. Are they very innovative? And then has that innovation led to their dominant position? So Apple, for example, I mean, until very recently, not innovative at all. I mean, it, it didn't have a research arm, really. I mean, it was just a few guys. So, but what was so good about them was they knew what customers wanted before the customers knew they wanted it himself, themselves. You know, so, um, uh, Microsoft is innovative, technically innovative, but most of its business success has come from being the bits that are aggressively not innovative, do you see what I mean? You know, so they're currently making most of their money out of cloud um, provision. That most certainly wasn't their idea. And they were second followers. They were second followers on um, web, weren't they? You know, famously, um, they they bought, um, was it Netscape? No, Netscape. They bought one of these browser companies, didn't they? Um, 
Google has been highly innovative in the past, but it, it's got a lot. There's a lot of its innovation has arisen through um, through through acquisition. I mean, Deep uh, DeepMind was a was an acquisition of a British company, of course, and that's what's making a lot of a runner in the innovation at the moment. Their innovation was essentially realizing that you could make money selling people's data, right? And that, I claim, is really a social innovation. And they realized that people wouldn't be up in arms about uh, selling the data if they got stuff free. And they might have got that wrong, would not they? They might, you know, they, they might have swung around that. But that was really the clever thing about Google, I think. Was it a great search engine? Well, it was all right, you know. Was it noticeably different from Alpha Vista or Bing? Well, not really, you know. Not let's be honest, not really. But it was free and it was fast, you know. That that was the great thing I think about uh, uh, Google and Alphabet, the company. So, um, can I point you to a formal study which proves what I'm saying? No, but I strongly suspect it. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of interesting questions uh, about uh, America. Um, so uh, basically, uh, both Peter Cousins and John Knight sort of ask the same thing. Peter Cousins says, is the reason why Americans succeed simply due to having a bigger local market? And John Knight's, uh, in my view, a big reason for U.S. company success is the huge, relatively homogenous domestic market. Um, uh, any, any comments on that? Yeah. I think they're right, but they're right in perhaps more ways than they think. You know, so there's the econo the economist in you just says, oh, yes, local market, cheap distribution and so on. But it's also um, if you've got a socially homogeneous market, then your social predictions are so much easier, aren't they? You know, it's easier to know what the future looks like when you all act the same. So far be it from me to say that the US is a particularly socially homogeneous country, but I think there might be an element of that. So I think there are there are two aspects of uh, two aspects of that. Yeah. So I wouldn't disagree with that thesis, but I don't accept that, that as the sole reason for their um, success. And if you struck the British and U.S. Uh, claim in my title and the title of my talk, I still claim <laughs> that societal prediction is. Uh, not looked at enough and is a vital missing component in our lives. Mm. Well, I, I, I too would actually point to uh, small nations which are on a per capita basis. You know, Switzerland's a good example. Horrifically inventive and developed all on their own with nine million people and you know gargantuan companies there that are uh, you know world beaters. Um, oh, Israel, I, I guess, is another one. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure the size or the size of the market, particularly in what, what's become over the last uh, sort of 60 years, much more a global market. I remember working in R&D in the 80s up at uh, British Leyland, and they talk about the best of British technology. And I was sort of going, nobody wants the best of British. They want the best in the world. And now yeah. people would find that attitude, you know, 30, 40 years later, idiotic. But at the time, it, it was fairly dominant and nationalist. And, of course, we then move into a lot of the discussions about cities being the engines of invention. So it's the city that matters and not necessarily the country in which it resides where a lot of our analysis is confused. But um, that's good. Um, Edwina Morton uh, says, you know, given your title, and we're still on this American bit, which I think is worth poking at, uh, but given the title, the implication would be that Americans are better at predicting the future. Is that the case? Or are they better at throwing money at problems, failing, learning, and moving on quickly? I think probably all of those things, but um, there's, there's a very strong theme in US history about being very interested in US society and how it functions, right? And a very strong theme, both from the right wing and from the left wing, thinking about what the US society should be like. You know, there's a, it's not just pioneering, it's almost evangelistic about how society should be and it's a very noticeable there's a noticeable difference between if you think about um Hofstadter the uh, Dutch sociologist Hofstadter's dimensions of culture right which measure how similar peoples are across different cultures US and the UK are very similar but my recollection is that there are different scores on attitude toward the future for example uh, US tend to be slightly more optimistic about the future 
than the Brits, who themselves, of course, are wildly more optimistic about the future than many other countries. So both countries have that uh, future optimism built into them, um, unlike, for example, say, Russia, where the future is bad, you know, um, brings, brings fear and danger. So I think there is a strong interest in the US about future society, and I believe that feeds through into the way uh, they evaluate innovation, because the question that arises, it tends to arise more often on that side of the Atlantic, is what will this do for the customer or for society? Whereas what tend, often happens in this side of the Atlantic is, is this cool stuff? Mm. Now, it may not be cool stuff, but the question is, is what's it gonna do for society? Well, uh, Professor uh, Rick Chandler makes a really interesting comment here. Uh, the UK gave the US jet engines, radar, computers uh, during Lend Lease. Uh, Rick, I could have a few arguments with you about yeah, that. Hang on, uh, but carry on. <laughs> we gave away ARM, et cetera. We allowed the EU to migrate our aerospace industry to Toulouse. You know, why don't the British government investors believe in us? Um, that, that's an interesting, an interesting point. So what? I wouldn't leave it as stolen or anything, but why is it that when it comes time to mature, a lot of these businesses don't find the UK the ground for that? Um, we were talking about this before we came on air, actually. The um, the thing, uh, as you go up the TRL level, there's an investment point called the value of death, and that's where the state gives up funding and the private sector starts. And uh, various people have written about the value of death. Uh, some people think that um, the private sector should start a lot earlier. And uh, what well, Thomas Keeley is the famous example of that, who thinks that government funds essentially are unnecessary. Um, the private sector will fill the gap. It, what happened, what is the nice thing about the US, and this is one of the reasons to be cheerful, I think, is the US has a number of sort of para government organizations like. Uh, NASA and DARPA and so on, which are quite good at filling the valley of death. So possibly that is one explanation for the ease US companies find on as they progress up the TRL level. The UK has recently introduced one of these, but it looks quite well funded area. So that might be a help. Hmm. Well, actually, I have had a look at the RAF funding, which, uh, if it proceeds, uh, it seems to be in stasis at the moment. There's actually only about 800 million, which doesn't compare on a per capita basis to DARPA at all. Yeah. It's a grotesque. Uh, Michael, I mean, you you probably have a better bead on what's going on about the funding arrangements between the UK and the US, but um, I'm not persuaded it's just about money. <laughs> Yeah, I'd agree there as well. It's uh, it's not just the cash, it's the attitude. And, and there's an interesting theme developing here in the q and I'll try and pull it together, but uh, to give you a bit of warning, it seems to be about uh, velocity and the ability to move fast alongside the tolerance of failure as kind of one, mm -hmm. uh, one sort of spectrum here. So just a few comments on that. Uh, John Munford is the US much more tolerant of failure, uh, where the British scorn it. Uh, we've got a, a really neat comment here from John O'Hara. Does predicting the future have anything to do with creating successful innovative businesses? I would propose that throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks at high velocity is the driver. Velocity is a key part of this, and if you're moving fast, you're going to fail more often. Run fast and break things, uh, attributed to Zuckerman. Uh, and he continues, velocity and bureaucracy are unusual bedfellows in the absence of a national crisis. Um, so uh, some interesting stuff here about speed. And I must say, uh, you know, Bill Janeway wrote a wonderful book, uh, Cambridge Economist, American Cambridge Economist, uh, as well as British Cambridge Economist. And in that, he just points out that if you want innovation, it comes in two forms, war and bubbles. It's financial bubbles where people just throw money at it because you need to be able to tolerate high degrees of wastage for innovation. But anyway, velocity um, versus tolerance of failure or along with tolerance of failure. Any comments on that? Yeah. Um... Well, I think these are comments probably coming from people who know a lot more about this than I do. I, I am a big fan of throwing things at the wall at high speed um, without much scrutiny. Um, and that is essentially having a tolerance of failure, isn't it? Because, um, for example, let me give you a little example. The major funder in uh, 
Britain for engineering work is something called the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. They've got a lot of money. Um, if I was to write an EPSA grant now um, for about 800,000, which would cover about three years of work, probably take me six months of work to write it. Not full on, but you know, you couldn't really get it together in six months. And then it was about probably 10 to one daily rate, maybe six to one, depends which university you're at. Oxford and Cambridge have worse rates than others. They're less successful at writing grants than other people for reasons that have not yet been explained. Um, that is a bit wasteful. <laughs> You know, that, and you're essentially being judged by a committee of people like you, brackets your enemies, um, who tend to come to rather boring conclusions. It, it would be so much better if I just got rung up and said, now, Richard, we've got we've got 500,000 to give you. Um, the lotteries, you know, your lottery tickets come in. Would you please write a description of how you think it should be spent? Um, it, I, I'm convinced it would be just as efficient as uh, it, it may be more efficient than the method we've got at the moment, and it would be more fun. Okay. I'd like to turn briefly uh, to the COVID vaccine. Arthur Scully, why was the COVID vaccine development so successful? And Liz Thrussell, a crisis changed the changes the dynamics. COVID developed in months. Quant easing and the financial crisis developed in months. So now climate change. Can we can we solve things in months instead of decades if if we uh, develop a sense of crisis? Yeah, I mean, all the COVID vaccines were amazingly heavily supported by governments who were bricking it over the situation. So they completely de-risked all of the uh, all of the project, is my recollection. And then virtually companies stopped in order to hammer production. You know, if you read what Pfizer did in order to get that vaccine into production, it was it was amazing, really. Now, to be fair, money wasn't an issue because any government they approached said, yeah, OK, we'll pay, we'll pay. It's not a problem. You know, and that's also true of the uh, the AZ, the AstraZeneca um, vaccine. So why were they successful? Because the there was absolutely no financial downside whatsoever. You didn't have to have any bureaucrats uh, weighing the relative merits of various things you could be doing. Um, and at least in the case of uh, Sarah Gilbert, a UEA alum, I should say, um, she worked, as far as I can tell, well, listening to her talk, I mean, she got up at two in the morning every day and worked through to about midnight for or six months. You know? um, and it's, it's just, just amazing. Um, some of that is scalable, some of it is not. Now, Bob Shrepp and I, Bob, Bob's a, a defense analyst in the States, uh, published uh, a report um, in the IEEE back in the late 90s, early 2000s, a, a series of papers looking at where defense procurement in science and technology had been successful. And the only examples he could find were urgent operational requirements where we basically take the rule book and throw it out. <laughs> and we have a deadline and we have a real person who's got a need and needs to use it. So there's quite a bit to the crisis yeah. theory. I worked um, on an emergency defense project. It was very successful. It was delivered in months rather than years. And the Ministry of Defense after that made jolly sure that we could never procure anything like that again. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I've got a couple of comments uh, featuring, uh, usefully, our previous threads. Uh, Martina King just points out that Google also disrupted search by launching the web, web crawler because web portals had been manual previously. Good, good point, Martina. Thank you. And John Knights, I think, makes an interesting comment on the, um, the mid-size. So we spoke about small countries and large countries, but small countries know they have no domestic market, um, whereas mid-sized countries, and which I guess uh, John would indicate Britain, tend to focus on their domestic market perhaps too much. So that's a good, that's a good point as well, that you can maybe, and the sweet spot is not in the middle, it's either to be small or to be large, and uh, you, you could get squeezed in the center. Um, just, to, just to add to that, these are other ways of saying we should understand society a bit better. You know, um, very good. Uh, Julian Parsons, uh, re regarding US technology success, how much importance uh, do you, Richard, 
uh, consider is derived from what we hear is the very close startup mentoring network in San Francisco, for example. Does mentoring help? I'm not very persuaded. I mean, the, the Cambridge network is pretty close, you know, and um, Silicon Fen, as it's called. Um, most of the features of Silicon Valley are replicated in, in Silicon Fen and probably on Silicon Roundabout. I know less about Silicon Roundabout. Um, so the salaries are better, aren't they, in Silicon Valley, but it's very expensive to live there. So. Um, I'm not very persuaded by that myself. I, I think um, I remember being at a pitch. We were pitching a business in uh, one of the angel uh, networks in Cambridge, and um, we were up against some fantastic businesses. And we had a very high tech uh, proposition with two profs talking about it. And afterwards, there were breakout sessions. No one went to any of the other, they all came to ours despite the fact it was quite obvious to me that ours was the least investable proposition of all of them. But it was romance, you know, profs, patents, tech, new tech, we're in Cambridge, let's pile money into those guys. It was the most peculiar experience. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Sam Carmelt, uh, dialing in from Switzerland, points out the rapidity of energy innovation is more difficult because of the central role of energy in the economy and uh, and I, I think he's got a point. I mean, one of the things when we had the move from the IT people moving into green tech, and I, I said this at the time, was they're going to find it a lot harder. You know, you, you take a piece of software, and particularly with the internet, you've immediately got an eight billion market if you want it. <laughs> uh, energy is long and hard in science. Now, to be fair, I think I've been proven slightly long by, by Elon Musk and the rapid progress he's made, for example, in batteries. So let, let's not uh, take my prejudices too far. Um, but is that the case that this sort of central role of energy means that, and uh, means that we might be finding the rate of innovation slowing down? Well, so British investors will frequently say, don't do B2C, but business to consumer businesses, you know, because they've got to build a market. You should always do B2B because then you can sell it on to a big American company. Energy has got quite a bit of B2B in it, hasn't it? Um, and they're big stultries. They're big sort of stodgy players. I mean, I, I've had a miserable experience in the past life trying to blog something to uh, an energy company and it, it, they're so slow. So Elon Musk, he, he said, well, I'll, I'll do go B2C because then I'm, I can get away from this horrible stodge associated with, you know, the B2B stodge associated with energy. So maybe that's the way forward, which is, you're quite right, there won't be innovation at the rate we need it in energy unless people are prepared to do B2C propositions. Mm. Consumers will always move faster than some stodgy utilities company. Uh, I've got some really interesting comments which we'll all get to you. Nick Bertel's talking about being involved with Eralis, a patented modular jet aircraft system, but unable to really, having got the seed funding uh, and support from the RAF, had to go to the Middle East because the British investors were uh, too short term. Uh, and a few other things out here, which I'll, I will feed back to you. But I'd like to close in the in the couple of minutes we have on a on just just your main thesis here on futurology itself. Um, when I looked at your list of uh, folks who who did it personally, I, I have found the sci-fi community to be excellent. So you know, metaverse is finally coming. Uh, that's a friend of mine, Neil Stevenson, who coined that phrase some 30 years ago. Um, we, we've seen, you know, William Gibson as well, a uh, very, very good cyberpunk, and, um, and that's all fine and good. But if I buy into your thesis that I've got to really get my futurology right to get my investment right, how would I know when I've got futurology in some sort of sensible space for what I'm trying to do? Well, the normal way of science would be you've got to make predictions and test them, haven't you? And the, what we'd normally ask for, there's a sort of hierarchy of, uh, if you think about computer science, what, what are we, at the bottom we've got theories, right, which predict things, and up here we've got methodologies, which are ways of doing things, which at least are systematic, you know. <laughs> Futurology doesn't have, doesn't have anything down here, it doesn't have any predictions, mid-level predictions, and it doesn't even have a methodology. There are a couple that I talked about, but they're not fully worked out and written down. There isn't a an agile methodology for futurology or a waterfall. 
technique. There's nothing. There's just creative people writing stuff. So I would first ask that you have a methodology and you're using it carefully. So there are some organizations, uh, Shell, for example, I think have been quite good at using um, scenario planning over the years. Um, and the second thing, and we're, we're way away from that, which is you're making predictions and testing them and, yeah. and modifying. Yes. Well, I personally take take from your talk uh, exactly that, that we should be starting with futurology before we start looking at all of the other stuff that's there. And that futurology hasn't been treated as a, as a discipline uh, by society as a whole. Uh, individual practitioners, I agree with you, have spent a lot of time on it. Um, we do, in fact, have a couple. Uh, Jill Ringland, who's been way behind scenario planning, is in fact giving a, a, an event for us in, in a month or two. So there are people out there they're doing this. And we, too, have been involved in areas like prediction markets, which uh, for, we're getting on now for over 20 years. But all of this is still not quite pieced together, is it? No, it's, it's individual and small heroic efforts, mm -hmm. which I should have mentioned more of. But, you know, it's the glimmerings of hope. But we really, as a community, need to take this a bit more seriously and try and build it into our own, uh, certainly our own investment processes. Okay. Well, we've got tons of comments and I wish we had more time. Uh, Trevor Hilder is like, on um, your economics point, what about redesigning the nature of money? Uh, we've got uh, people out here interested, John Knights again, on ethics and values and in investment. Uh, and there's a tremendous, we could go on for ages, but it has been a great discussion, Richard. You've really ignited the audience uh, and I'm delighted uh, for that. If I may, I'm just going to turn to three quick rounds of thanks. Firstly, to our sponsors. Uh, I hope this is very much up your street, too. I, I suspect it definitely is. We're all trying to innovate. Uh, we've got to start doing it in better ways. Um, the tools are there. We just need to think more about the future. Uh, secondly, if I can, the audience, you've been particularly vibrant today. As promised, all these comments and things will be sent uh, to Richard. And please do. Uh, I'll, I won't bother to read out uh, the forthcoming events. Uh, but uh, we do have one uh, on Thursday on early research which is very related to today's topic. So uh, do check out the website as ever. But finally, and most importantly, Richard, we are very behind on technology here at Zen and FS Club. And I'm afraid the only way that we can present you with applause is to use my medieval uh, tool here, my Korean karmic clapper, uh, to open the floodgates of applause. But seriously, thank you so much for coming on. It's a delight to have a fellow uh, Gresham colleague here. And we hope perhaps you might uh, come back in future and uh, present some of your other thoughts. It's been really insightful. Thank you. Thanks.